In this video, we'll look at the Heathkit GR91 General Coverage Shortwave Receiver. I'll review the history of the radio, its features, and take a look at it inside and out. I'll discuss the restoration of this particular unit and demonstrate it being operated. Heathkit was well known as the premier manufacturer of electronics in kit form from the 1950s into the early 1990s. Their product line included shortwave and amateur radio equipment. At any given time, Heathkit typically offered several shortwave receivers in different price ranges. The GR91 was a mid-range general coverage radio receiver covering the AM broadcast band and shortwave up to 30 MHz. It was offered from 1961 to 1964 at a price of US $39.95. Typically, it was one of a range of shortwave receivers offered by Heathkit. This Christmas 1964 Canadian Heathkit catalog has the GR91 listed at $62.50, along with the newly introduced GR64 at $72.50, the high-end GC1A Mohican at $151.50, and the basic GR81 regenerative receiver at $39.95, all in Canadian dollars. The GR91 is a two-based shortwave receiver. It weighs in at about 9 pounds and covers the following frequencies in four bands. Band A, 550 kHz to 1600 kHz, the AM broadcast band. Band B, 1.5 MHz to 4 MHz shortwave. Band C, 4 MHz to 11 MHz shortwave. And band D, 9.5 MHz to 30 MHz shortwave. This was a moderately priced radio receiver. Given that, it still came with a number of features that might be considered by other manufacturers as optional extras, including speaker, band spread tuning, S-meter, headphone jack, lighted dial, and automatic noise limiter. The design uses four vacuum tubes and one semiconductor diode. It runs on 105 to 125 volts AC power and takes about 30 watts. There was no 220 volt wiring option. It uses a 455 kilohertz IF frequency. Neither the manual nor Heathkit catalogs publish specifications for sensitivity or selectivity, but performance is comparable to similar receivers of this era. It can be aligned with or without test instruments, and like most Heath products, it was sold only as a kit. The front panel features a 7-inch illuminated slide rule dial. The dial is marked with various bands including amateur radio and shortwave broadcast, as well as the time and frequency standard station WWV. It also has a 0 to 100 logging scale. At the right is the band spread dial. If you're not familiar with the concept of band spread tuning, it's a secondary control that allows more accurate tuning of closely spaced frequencies on a radio band. On this radio, the band spread is uncalibrated other than being marked from 0 to 10. Typically, band spread is needed to tune single sideband or Morse code signals, and on the highest band where tuning is the most crowded. From left to right, the front panel controls are power and volume, BFO or beat frequency oscillator, mode selectable as either AM, standby, or CW, the band switch selecting one of four bands, antenna trim, main tuning, and band spread tuning. The main tuning as a weighted flywheel and vernier using the standard dial cord and pulley system to drive a slide rule dial pointer augmented by the band spread for finer control of tuning. The internal speaker is mounted behind holes in the left side of the cabinet. The rear panel normally had a cover made from thick cardboard with holes for ventilation. It's missing on this unit. On the left is the two-wire power cord, followed by screw terminal connections for antenna and ground connections. There were several options for antennas. A balanced antenna using 300-ohm twin lead like a folded dipole 
would be connected to the rightmost two terminals. A long wire antenna could be connected to the rightmost terminal and a ground connection to the left terminal. A balanced antenna using 75 ohm coax cable like a dipole could be connected to the rightmost two terminals and a jumper connected from the middle terminal to the ground terminal. Next is a phono jack for connection to an optional Q multiplier. Then there's the A and L or automatic noise limiter on off switch. On the far right is a quarter inch jack for headphones. When used it disconnects the internal speaker. They recommended using 50 to 10,000 ohm impedance headphones. Inside you can see that most circuitry is on a single printed circuit board. The PCB connects to the chassis using screws. Over time these screws may need to be tightened to ensure a good connection. Some larger components such as the power and audio transformers, tuning capacitors and speaker are mounted on the chassis and connected using point-to-point -point wiring. Additional wiring goes to the front panel controls. The use of a printed circuit board made assembly much less labor intensive and error prone and overall a more pleasant experience than soldering all that point-to-point -point wiring. Underneath the chassis can be seen more circuitry including the band switch and the bottom of the printed circuit board. There's quite a bit of wiring from the circuit board to the switches, controls and jacks. Some are shielded or twisted with quite specific assembly instructions, otherwise hum could be a problem. The radio uses the following tube lineup, a 12BE6 oscillator mixer, 12BA6 IF amplifier and BFO, 12AV6 detector and audio amplifier, and a 50C5 audio output. It does a lot with only four tubes. The lack of an RF amplifier stage was the main design feature distinguishing it from higher end receivers. The 455 kHz IF frequency allowed the use of low cost AM radio IF transformers, but hurts image rejection on the short wave bands. The BFO circuit is very simple using a variable resistor that causes the IF amplifier to oscillate at the IF frequency when turned up. It's tricky to adjust as it's not very stable and interacts with the tuning. The power supply uses a transformer and a solid state diode in a half wave rectifier circuit. Somewhat unusual, the tube heater filaments are in a series string, but they're powered from the power transformer secondary, so they're floating with respect to ground and therefore safer than designs without a power transformer. The S meter is not calibrated, having only an arrow indicator on it. Later models like the GR64 at least had numeric indicators. The A and L or automatic noise limiter is a simple circuit that uses a diode that conducts and clips the signal when it's too high. It's not particularly effective, but it is low cost. This circuit only uses one diode rather than the usual two, so it would have been very poor indeed. I suspect that the designers found that they had an extra diode element available unused in the 12AV6 tube and decided to add A and L since it only required the addition of a switch. Having it listed as a radio feature may have been more of a marketing gimmick than a useful feature. Placing the switch on the back also implies that it would not often be used. The operating instructions section in the manual doesn't even mention the A and L control. There's a connection on the back for an optional Q multiplier such as the Heathkit GD125. This would increase selectivity making the radio more suitable for receiving CW or Morse code signals. I have a separate YouTube video on the GD125. I bought this radio on eBay in January of 2016. It came without a manual but I found a full manual and schematic on the internet. The unit was in decent shape except for a badly scratched case and missing back panel. One could make a new rear panel out of heavy cardboard if desired but it doesn't serve much purpose except making the unit a little safer and looking better cosmetically from the back. There are some scratches on the front panel and rust on the bottom cover but the chassis is pretty clean. One knob is not original, but it's pretty close. Workmanship, specifically soldering, is okay, but not great. In at least one place, repairs had to be made to fix tracks that had lifted, typically due to heating them too much or too often. 
There was also some green fluid on some of the wires. I'm not sure what it is, possibly corrosion or the remnants of some type of contact cleaner. When initially carefully powered up using a Variac, AM seemed to be working. There was some noise on the short wave bands, but it didn't seem to be very sensitive. I gave everything a good cleaning and fixed one broken ground wire on one of the interconnection wires. I disassembled the dial to clean it. The unit was then found to be picking up numerous short wave stations in the evening with just a piece of wire for an antenna. It was taking longer on power up to warm up than it should, over 45 seconds. Examining the circuitry under the chassis, it was missing the PTC resistor referred to in the manual as a glow bar. This was used to drop the heater voltage while reducing the surge at power on, especially when powered up when the tubes were already warm. Instead of this, it had a 600 ohm wire wound resistor in series, the one that would normally be in parallel with the pilot lamps. This caused the tube heater voltages to be a little bit lower than normal because it was a higher value than the 100 ohm glow bar. Calculating from the original circuit, a resistor of about 220 ohms would be needed to get the correct heater voltages and current. I rewired it to add a 220 ohm 5 watt resistor. After that, the pilot lamps were brighter and the warm-up time was about 10 seconds from cold. This model did not suffer from the plastic dial cracking problems that some later models did. I plan to repaint the cover using some hammer tone rust paint of a similar color. This radio does not have any wax paper capacitors, so I didn't have to replace any of them. The electrolytic filter capacitors tested okay, so I left them. They're all contained in one package. Alignment of this radio can be done with or without instruments. Without instruments, the trimmer caps were set to a specific number of turns and the coils were factory adjusted. If you had an RF signal generator and voltmeter, you could align it more accurately. The manual describes the procedure consisting of 21 steps. It consists of adjusting the IF transformers at 455 kilohertz and then each band at the low and high ends. I ran through the procedure using an accurate signal generator and oscilloscope and it went smoothly. The alignment was quite a bit off, so I assume the original owner of the radio likely aligned it without instruments. Because of the low 455 kHz IF frequency, you have to watch out that you don't align it to the image frequency that's only 910 kHz away from the correct one. The manual mentions this in the procedure. While often alignment of radios needs to be done with covers installed, on this unit, alignment needs to be done without the bottom plate installed because you need it removed to access the bottom slugs of the IF transformers. The radio is better than some models in that it's aligned at both ends of each band, so accuracy of the dial pointer is pretty good when accurately aligned. Some radio models align a band in one place and hope that it's not too far off at the other end of the dial. Let's listen to the radio on the air. I have it connected to my outdoor amateur radio dipole antenna. Band A is the AM broadcast band. We can pick up a few local stations that are broadcasting here in Ottawa, Canada. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Aaron Gordon. Orlando Magic, my Orlando Magic. 40 centimeters of snow in some areas that could turn into some freezing rain and ice pellets by the app. On shortwave band C, 4 to 10 megahertz, we can pick up a number of stations this evening around the shortwave broadcast bands. Here's what you'll hear about. Uh, 
Here I'm listening to an amateur radio station transmitting in Morse code. For CW or single sideband reception, you turn to CW mode, which turns off the automatic gain control. Then turn up the BFO and adjust both the BFO and tuning, usually band spread, for the best signal. Tuning of CW and single sideband signals is quite tedious as there's interaction between the BFO and band spread controls. The BFO provides some regeneration, so it can also improve sensitivity when turned on for AM signals. Introduced in 1961, the year I was born, the GR91 was one of Heathkit's mid-range shortwave receivers. It has the usual excellent Heathkit assembly manual which covers theory of operation, characteristics of the different short wave bands, and how to make some simple antennas. The radio is reasonably sensitive and can pick up lots of short wave broadcast signals with a decent antenna. It would not be very suitable for serious amateur radio use as bands like the 40 meter ham band only take up a small portion of the dial. The BFO is also hard to use as it's not very stable and interacts with other controls so it could be used for strong CW signals but would be frustrating for single sideband. The lack of selectivity could be somewhat improved by adding the optional GD125Q multiplier. In 1964 it was replaced by the GR64. That radio was very similar but featured more modern styling, an AM loop antenna and calibrated band spread and S meter. In summary, while a mid-range radio for the price of $40 in 1961, which is equivalent to a little over $300 today, the GR91 was a good value, a fun kit to build, and got many people started in ham radio or shortwave listening. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out my other YouTube videos on vintage amateur radio and test equipment.